start here. So uh, welcome to this uh, session on uh, digital twins in Europe. There are quite a, a lot of activities going on in this domain now with things like Destination Earth, lots of uh, research calls in the Horizon program who tackle the digital twins um, and, and also exciting new things happening in the European Space Agency, HumanSat and other actors here in uh, Europe. So I thought it's is quite central to bring all the people together, see a little bit how this all fits also into the context of uh, Eurogeo and how, how we can all collaborate on some of the challenging topics in this domain, tackling things like harmonization of the data streams of the architectures or the software architectures, interoperability between different of them, uh, federation, data spaces, all kinds of concepts that we need to tackle here. And finally, also some challenges in the terms of uh, the long-term support and operation of such services once you have a digital twin. In general, I think we can all agree that is a useful tool that helps us to make decisions if we have to set up them well and can really try different scenarios, play around with them and understand uh, different things better based on the models that we have. And yeah, really looking forward to this. So the first speaker today will be Thomas Heinen from ECMWF, and he will talk about the digital twin engine of Destination Earth. So Thomas, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so very good. Um, so I would like to talk a little bit about Destination Earth and what we're doing in trying to make Destination Earth a platform where other digital twins can coexist with the digital twins that we're currently developing how we work with European projects under the Horizon Europe program and also other initiatives. So first, maybe a few words about Destination Earth itself. Uh, it's a long running uh, initiative funded directly by the, by the commission with the aim to put um, uh, Destination Earth in, in production, long-term production by 2030. So we're working towards that, that goal to have something that is sustainable in the, in the long-term as well. Uh, it's executed by three entrusted entities, ECNWF, where I work, ESA and Numitsat. And currently we're in the first phase of Destination Earth and we're focusing on four main uh, elements, basically developing the platforms, the core platform, the data lake and uh, the environment where the digital twins uh, run, the digital twin engine, and actually implementing the first two digital twins, one on extreme weather and the other one on climate change uh, adaptation. So this is a high level overview of the landscape, what it looks like. So as you can see, uh, on the right hand side, you have the users interacting with the system. There's a core platform where the digital twins can be discovered, explored, the data can be discovered and explored and used. Um, additional applications can be deployed and run. Um, from there, we have the connection with the data lake where the output of the digital twin data will be stored, but also uh, other data sources will be federated that you can use to run your digital twin or maybe combine different data sources to, to, uh, to build additional applications on top of what you provide. Um, and then we have the digital twin engine, which is the focus of this, of this talk, which is basically the set of services and software infrastructure and components that allow you to run and operate and interact with these digital twins. So it really focuses on the data handling components on the, on the orchestration of the, of the twins. So currently, uh, the two digital twins that we're, that we're working on uh, have a strong focus on uh, improving the quality of the models themselves. We're going to quite extreme uh, resolutions uh, globally and also improving the, the models on a regional level. The second important component is that we want to develop impact sector uh, simulations and models uh, that can zoom in to particular areas where these impacts are, uh, are felt. And obviously, a digital twin has a very uh, strong interactive component as well, where people can interact with these models and with the data to run their own scenarios and to understand how certain uh, uh, policy decisions will, will, will fan out and the impact of those decisions, right? So here's an example of the, of the continuous uh, on-demand for uh, an on-demand for, for extreme weather. So we run, we're on a global model that can detect certain extreme events. As soon as an event like that is detected, regional models can be, uh, can be run. We can zoom in and we can track them. So here, for instance, you see an animation where we zoom into a certain part of the global model. And then you can see that we can track even across uh, uh, borders, different, uh, different countries. We, we can track a certain extreme event over time and analyze uh, the impact uh, for, uh, on, for instance, in this case, uh, South Southern Europe. 
Similar thing we do for, uh, for, for climate. So on the, on the right hand side, you see a high resolution global five kilometer uh, run for, uh, for climate uh, prediction, uh, which allows you to, uh, to get a much better quality model on the one hand, but also to couple the information more directly with, uh, with regional models. You can understand that if you, if you, on the left hand side, if you have to go from that model and try to interpret the local effect is really difficult to do that because the, the blocks are just very, very big. It's much easier to, to zoom in from an already high resolution model, which, which also has obviously a higher quality already. Here we have the same approach. So these are again, global uh, climate simulations. We can zoom in, for instance, in this case, we zoom in over uh, Western Europe and there we zoom in even further and we select a single point um, where a uh, wind farm is, uh, is developed and we can predict or run scenarios on the wind farm production on a specific uh, uh, location given different climate uh, scenarios, right? So it's quite, quite detailed in that sense. So then a few words about interoperability, what the topic of this, um, of this, uh, of this session is. So as you can see, uh, digital twins typically have a lot of different components. And yes, there's a big model as well that sits in the middle and it's very important, but there's a lot of different interfaces and a lot of different uh, services that are basically, uh, that are sitting around this digital twin. And uh, users interact via these components with the model, right? So we have components that allow you to, uh, to operate on the data. And we have components that allow you to operate on the, on the models itself by the control flow of these models. And what we, what we are currently doing is we are working with other Horizon Europe product and also other uh, projects to understand how we can harmonize these interfaces and how we can make these interfaces interoperable between the different projects uh, to allow digital twin from one project to be run uh, in the context of another project or in the context of destination Earth itself. By doing that, we found that we actually cannot talk about uh, interoperability in a, single, uh, in a single sense. We have to talk about an integration continuum. So potentially there are digital twins that need to interact with each other on a, on a, on a deep physics level, right? So for instance, you have a digital twin of a volcano that emits ashes into the atmosphere and you have a digital twin of the atmosphere and then you, you really want to have a coupling on the physics, right? So that means you have a really tight integration. And the interface looks completely different than when you go to the complete right-hand side of the spectrum, where maybe someone just wants some data or some information from, from Destination Earth. And he might not even be aware of all the underlying components, right? So he doesn't have to do a lot of integration, it's just on the consumption uh, level. But that's just really uh, something important to, to keep in mind when you talk about integration. It's not always the same thing, right? You have to really have to think, what is my use case? What do I need from the system? And where do I put these interfaces? So this is an, another interesting uh, example um, where uh, we have a uh, streaming model of the data, so different digital twins, they stream out the data in a, in a, in a, in a generalized form. An application can sit in that data stream and consume the data and also feedback the results back into the model. So that's a really kind of a tight integration uh, concept. I mean, I know, I know. So, um, so here's a, a little bit our, our, our approach there. So we, we try to harmonize these architectures identify the different uh, functional components, identify also the, 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 the tools and components that are being used to implement these functions in a different architecture and try to understand where we have to define these interfaces and where do we have to uh, define interoperability. Uh, and the way we do that is by drawing these solution paths to the landscape. So you have a use case, you bring a use case, you draw your, your solution to the landscape, you, you identify the interoperability points and then we, we solve those Per, per use case. And by doing that, building up the, the landscape and making it more interoperable in, in general. And that being said, I would like to invite you all to come to the Destination or User Exchange meeting in November, where we're gonna do this, this exercise also for use cases that are not funded by Horizon Europe, but it's really we open the floor to everybody who wants to work with Destination Earth. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, uh, Thomas, for this great uh, presentation and keeping the time perfectly. Good example for the first speaker. Uh, is there any quick question now? I would take just one short question now so that we have more time for discussion. Yes, we have one over there. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, how are you dealing with uh, the difference in the spatial variability that also affects the uh, microphysics 
and the other components of the system. Because if you go from uh, a course resolution on a global scale back to a convective scale or even yeah. to 500 meters, I suppose that it was quite complex with all this scalability, both in the spatial terms, temporal, and also the physics. Yeah, so definitely impact of physics. So uh, we uh, do a lot of parameterization, right? So physics that we cannot resolve, we parameterize them. Of course, if you go to higher resolution, there's more physics that you can resolve, but you cannot resolve everything because there's always physics happening on a scale that you don't resolve. So you have to rethink what you parameterize and what you resolve. We think by going to this kilometer scale uh, resolution, we resolve a very important uh, physics uh, scale and can really improve the quality of the, of the models. But obviously there's still many, many scales below that that you still have to parameterize. Okay, thank you. Then I would invite uh, now the second speaker on the stage, which is Andrea Manzi from EGI. He will talk about uh, the InterTwin project, the blueprint architecture for digital twins. So the floor is yours, Andrea, welcome. Thank you. I'm not so tall as Thomas, so I have to. <laughs> uh, so uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Andrea Manzi from the EGI Foundation. Uh, I will introduce the InterTeam project and um, the link to also to uh, Destination Earth and uh, other projects that are building this near twin of the Earth. So we, as a high level overview of the project, we uh, aim at building a prototype digital twin engine, which is based on a co-design digital twin engine uh, blueprint architecture. The, um, the aim of the project is to build this uh, engine interdisciplinary and co-design with the providers and the communities that are part of the project. Uh, the platform that we are building is open source with the uh, TRL level of TRL 6 or 7, depending on the components. And uh, the main thing is that the engine should support uh, digital twin application in various domains. So we... Uh, so this is a quick overview of the consortium. So AGI Foundation is the uh, coordinator. So then we have like 29 participants. The project started in September in the last three years. So in total, we have like uh, several providers uh, from resources in cloud, HTC and HPC, uh, technology providers and community representatives. Uh, so quickly, so we have like two main uh, digital prints areas. So one in the physics domain, which is, uh, so we have like a, uh, four digital prints uh, developed by uh, high energy physics, quantum field theory, radio astronomy, and the gravitational wave astronomy. So for today, I think I'm not going to go into details on this. But the main uh, for today, I think that uh, it's important to realize what are the digital prints for the stream events of the Earth, which are the other six digital twins that we use as a use case for uh, piloting the digital twin engine that we are building. And uh, we have different uh, uh, organizations that are working on this, also EURAC, so Alex here and the East team. Um, so the, 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 main, the main digital twins are dealing with the uh, climate change impact for the projection of extreme events in terms of storms and fires, early warning for uh, floods and droughts, and uh, climate change impacts for extreme events in storms, fire, floods, and, and droughts. These are the, the, the main area. So uh, as I said before, um, the project started like more or less one year ago. We, de we delivered the first architecture blueprint, which uh, is available now also in GitHub with another with the specification. Uh, there will be another version that is uh, under development at the beginning of 2024. And then the last one will be ready by the end of the well, next year. It also, of course, take into account, apart from the requirements from the user communities, but also the initiatives and projects which are um, linked or, uh, you know, in the European, uh, uh, in the European uh, um, landscape. So, of course, Destination Earth, EOSC, uh, other projects also that are coming from energy physics, given that we have also this part in the project. So, we try to reuse, for instance, technologies that are coming from other domains, like energy physics, also in the context of, uh, you know, the... Uh, climate and, and the EU. Uh, this is a new review of the components that we, the architecture that uh, at the moment uh, is, uh, has been uh, released. So uh, in our case, the digital twin engine is divided in three layers. So we have a layer of infrastructure, so the resources, the providers that are giving, the, and then a level of orchestration and federated data management. On top of this, we have a layer of uh, core components 
which deals with the workload composition, uh, quality management, and uh, uh, serverless computing. And then we have also a layer of thematic modules, which are tailored to the needs of the digital prints, which are really the, 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 the application on top. And they are developed also in, in uh, by the same communities which are developed with digital prints, they're also developing the, these modules which are plugable into the, into the core. And we deal with two types of users. So the end users, which are the ones that use the digital prints. And then we have the developers, which use the engine, the digital twin engine as a, as a pass in order to develop digital prints to be used by the, by the application, by the users on top. Uh, so quickly, so uh, this, I put here some of the technologies or the, that we are using and extending or developing from scratch in the different layer. So for the part of the orchestrator, we are using like uh, Tosca. So the components that are uh, dealing with the, um, uh, with the definition of uh, deployment request in Tosca templates. Uh, for, the, for the data management, uh, we use what uh, is a blueprint from uh, coming from the project escape. So in the uh, energy physics domain, uh, and all the, uh, which we are trying to extend also to include the stack catalog on, on there. And from the federated compute, we'll try to uh, de develop a way to uh, offload uh, and uh, homogenize the access to the different uh, type of HPC, HTC, and cloud. And for the, you know, this is uh, just to give you an idea of the different uh, uh, compute and resources that we have in the, in the project. So we have like a cloud HTC and HPC provider, including HPC. Some of them, they offer both cloud and HPC or HTC as well. So there are different classes of uh, resources and different requirements coming from them as well. And for the core, uh, we have like, a, you know, the part of the work of composition, which is based on the CWL and running on the uh, different uh, um, um, type of uh, workflow engines and uh, try, try to execute also different, different backends uh, for that analysis like OpenEO, Dask or Spark and uh, also merged with the ML and, uh, and AI uh, training platform. Uh, we have also uh, components for real-time and data acquisition and processing and quality verification, which is based on a, comp a component which comes from another project, use Synergy, that uh, is, uh, is been extended in, the, in, the, in this context of this project. And finally, on the thematic part, we, as I said, these are the components that we want to um, uh, so, so developed by the digital prints, let's say applications, plugged into uh, existing core components. And if those components will be reused by uh, different uh, resource communities, we will, let's say they will be promoted as core components in the, in the infrastructure. So this is the different thematic module that we are supporting. So as a timeline, so basically we completed the first uh, design and the specification in June was the deadline for that. So we are preparing the first release of the software, which is at the end of the year. So in November, we will have the internal release and then the public release will be uh, beginning of 2024, which will uh, then be validated by the digital prints that will use the software uh, in April next year. And then we have another round in time, we also update the design specification and the blueprint architecture. And then the second software release will be at the end of uh, uh, close to the end of the project, so uh, in um, April 2025, and then the final validation in August. All the components that we are developing are ready in, uh, in GitHub, so we have a community in GitHub, but you can check uh, what uh, the first component that uh, are being uh, developed in, the, in this, uh, this regard. Uh, for the part of the interoperability technology chain, this was also mentioned by, by Thomas, so basically we try to uh, Plan, we are planning and we are working also with the SNWF, Thomas is also a member of the, of the project, to design a compatible architecture. Uh, we have also uh, started to work together with DigiConnect, that is an activity also started with other project uh, that has been um, funded in, the, um, in Horizon Europe to deal with the uh, Earth digital prints like uh, BioDT, DDGO and uh, Edito Infra, which is the infrastructure of the digital prints of the ocean. Uh, to have basically these activities uh, to harmonize the architecture, have a common glossary of digital prints, like you know this uh, has been uh, mentioned by by Thomas. And for the so this is was of the one of the things that uh, we should discuss uh, in the in the session. So for sure the project uh, so is ending in 2025, 
and uh, the, the coordinator, so the GI Foundation, uh, is uh, um, uh, will operate the services that we, we we are building in the federation that is managing. Uh, one of the objective of the project is also to link the um, the to, to deliver the service in EOSC, so in the open to uh, to uh, uh, to the user of the EOSC can change. Uh, in parallel, of course, we would like to uh, integrate the technology, uh, if possible, in the destination Earth ecosystem. So we have like uh, some early discussion of some of the components that we are developing uh, to be piloted also in the context of destination Earth. And of course, the digital twins use cases that we are piloting now, if, if of course, we manage to have a uh, infrastructure or, or architecture which is um, interoperable with destination Earth, will be, uh, of course, will try to be hosted also in the future, in the, the what destination Earth is building in the infrastructure. For instance, one example is uh, this uh, early warning digital twin from uh, that was mentioned by Thomas. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, this is will be like one one way to continue also the exploitation of the digital twins that you are building in the context of destination Earth. Yeah, I think that's for set. Thanks a lot. If you have like a Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Um, any question, a quick question from the room here for Andrea immediately? I see you totally overwhelmed them very well. <laughs> There's one question, perfect, go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks for your very interesting work. I was wondering, uh, you you were talking about a general infrastructure that is able to handle different uh, um, digital twin, and uh, the the module, the specific module for the different digital twin are um, will be also they will follow also the open source uh, specification, and they will be published uh, in the same GitHub, or the, each project will uh, distribute to the or at least uh, communicate share the code uh, differently. So the the idea, I mean, I don't, I mean, we are not we are not forcing like all the different uh, communities to share the um, their models or in the output of the uh, the activity in digit in their in our intertwin. But everything that we are developing is open source. So basically starting from the technologies and also the models and everything. So this is for sure is gonna be released. I'm not sure if this will be in the interest in GitHub, but for sure it's in other repositories that uh, will be open. So okay. everything is everything is open. So basically. it's not yet discussed, but the, the framework is set. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Andrea. Then we can come to the next speaker. Uh, you can also sit here if you want to. Um, and the next speaker will be Jordi Duarte Suarez from Umitsat, and he will talk about the importance of data lakes in the context of uh, digital twins. So, um, Jordi, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes, thanks. Okay, so first of all, I'm sorry for myself not to share some days with you in this nice city of Bolzano. I'm very sorry I cannot join you. So let's see if uh, technology allows and we can we can present what is the data lake in the context of destination. Um, okay, so obviously there, there will be some overlap from the from the presentation given by Thomas because we are working in the same project. But I will introduce you uh, in general terms what is destination Earth. So with the aim of building a high highly accurate digital model of the Earth. Uh, with, I mean, uh, several objectives uh, and basically to develop, as I said, a very uh, precision, high precision digital model of the air uh, to monitor and simulate natural and human activity and to develop and test the scenarios for more sustainable development and for achieving both a green deal and the digital strategy, which are priorities for the European Commission and the European Union. Very ambitious project, I would say. Uh, so, as Thomas has said, so Destination Earth is a joint initiative uh, from three entities: European Space Agency, ECMWF, and UMEDSAT. We are developing uh, three different components of Destination Earth, which are self-standing components. 
So European Space Agency is responsible of what is called the core service platform, which is the entry point for the users in destination Earth. Then UMETSAT is responsible of the developing the destination Earth data lake, and ECMWF, as Thomas has said, is responsible of the digital twin uh, engine, which is the, the framework architecture, and also providing in this uh, first phase two uh, digital twins. One is for the extreme weather, uh, and, the, and the other one is for uh, the, the uh, for the climate climate adaptation. So there's these two digital twins and all digital twins that will be coming, obviously will be generating a huge amount of data because uh, we are talking about simulations with very high precision and very high uh, time resolution, which means obviously uh, high, a huge amount of gigabytes uh, to be stored and to be accessed. And this is in itself uh, a challenge and an endeavor. And, and then also we have the uh, in, in the data lake, uh, several different data sources that we plan to make accessible seamlessly for the users of Destination Earth. So not only satellite data, Earth observation data, but also uh, sensors and uh, Internet of Things data, other federation, federated data spaces from uh, social data, economical data, financial data, so everything that uh, can be available. And uh, obviously, also all uh, user-generated data that could be processed in the framework of uh, destination. So, uh, typical use case would be an expert uh, via the, the desk, the, the platform to access uh, destination Earth, uh, accessing to a portal, and then getting uh, through the um, the discovery service, the collection of services that Destination Earth will be offering. In this case, for example, we can discover all the different uh, data sets that uh, Destination, Earth, Destination Earth will be offering, uh, digital twin outputs, of course, also federated data spaces, as we have said, and uh, data generated by the users, and uh, a structure, for example, in data cubes that can be uh, system data cubes or user generated data cubes. Then, in order to create a collaborative research environment, the user will be able to uh, use uh, the, the computing infrastructure that is offered in this questionnaire, what is called the ISLET service, that will allow uh, to uh, deploy a full set of uh, network of virtual machines over a Kubernetes uh, environment. But do, there will be also the possibility to access already built-in uh, applications, for example, Jupyter Hub, or other types of applications, which will allow them to deploy uh, AIML libraries uh, that will be also uh, offered off the shelf of the system. And then we will have, through the test, advanced services that will allow visualization tools, for example, for the users already built in to exploit the data and to, uh, for example, work uh, with AIML frameworks. So more specifically, uh, the data lake, as we said, is a self-standing component, uh, which is uh, built a geographically uh, distributed infrastructure. Uh, Today, uh, the infrastructure is uh, already deployed in a central site, and a bridge has been already deployed as well in Finland, in the Lumi HPC site. And soon, there will be also uh, a new HPC deployment in Bologna uh, as part of the Leonardo HPC. So these bridges will be, let's say, interfacing with the digital twins and make, making the data generated by the digital twins to the destiny users. So the uh, data lake will be offering through a harmonized data access API, access to the different types of data sets uh, from, as we said, from federated data spaces, from data generated of, uh, by the digital twins through the, what is called the, the data warehouse component. It will contain also as well a fresh data pool that uh, will allow um, 
it's like a, a cache system that uh, is storing the most used data uh, from the different uh, federated data spaces and the different data sources that will be in the data lake. And, and this is with the principle of offering uh, near data computing, which is called edge computing. So in the sense that it will not, uh, it will not be required to download all the data to do the processing, but we pretend to move the processing where the data is uh, collocated. Okay, so this is again uh, uh, how the user will see the system. So through the discovery service, uh, the user will be offered with uh, different uh, data sets in the, in the catalog, which is called the data portfolio, the destination data portfolio. And then additional data services that will allow, will allow to do uh, data processing. So what is called uh, in destination big data processing services. From the data services, we will have digital outputs, federated data sets, user-generated data, and the face data pool that we have set. And then for the data processing, it will be offered the possibility to uh, use the islet service to deploy a network of virtual machines. Also, uh, hosted application services that, for example, Jupyter Hub using uh, the, the DAS gateway, which would allow to uh, do distributed processing uh, for example, to uh, develop uh, prototype algorithms, but all this uh, processing where the data is located. And then the hook service that will allow a collection of predefined functions that as well will allow to uh, move the processing where the data is located and perform some uh, functions distributed, also mixing with us uh, to do the, any type of processing. So here a bit more of detail. So the Islet service, what is uh, consist consisting of? So we will offer this capability of building uh, the user uh, defined uh, network of virtual machines, including uh, GPUs and object storage over a Kubernetes. Uh, and then obviously there will be a collection of blueprints uh, at disposition of the user that will in principle, facilitate the work and allow the user to select which type of work is planning to do and uh, get off the shelf uh, pre-configured uh, collection of virtual machines implementing this. Then, uh, in terms of course, the applications, we said we have the Jupyter Hub. Today, uh, it's already deployed with uh, the DAS gateway already implemented, allowing to do uh, the distributed processing. And then we have a collection of uh, predefined functions uh, that will allow to do this processing uh, near to the data, also provided on the shelf. All this to facilitate the deployment of uh, different processing capabilities, uh, so facilitating this to the user. No minutes. Okay, so just finishing. So this is uh, the idea that we can combine, obviously, the different services together. Uh, so we can combine uh, what would be, as we said, so functions, uh, predefined functions uh, with uh, the task gateway and then do this, this, this distributed processing and store the result in, a, uh, in the Islet service, so in their own uh, deployed virtual machines, and make these results available to the rest of the user. So this is a bit of the summary with the benefits of uh, we have already explained. No? So ready to use application functions, processing near to the data, harmonized and harmonized way to access data in a collaboration environment. And I think with this, I finished the data lake presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jordi. Is there any question from the room to Jordi, there's one question over there. On the side. Microphone is coming. Wait a second. Uh, uh, hi. Uh, I would like, it seems like the data lake will have a lot of uh, data inside. You mentioned the federated the data spaces, uh, access to these uh, data spaces, like the Green Deal data space, I suppose, and uh, uh, similar. Um, what is the technology you are using for finding uh, a particular set of data? Okay, if you know what you are looking like, Urban Atlas, okay, I know that it will be there because it's Copernicus. 
What about the less uh, visual uh, uh, products, like something from uh, Eurostat or a particular uh, set of uh, a layer? How do I find this? What is the technology behind? So obviously there will be a graphical user interface to access the catalog and browse the catalog, but also there is an API. And for example, Eurostat data, it uh, will be available through this API that is called the HDA API. And the HDA API will offer uh, seamless capabilities for all types of data to browse the catalog and to access the data and perform downloads or perform uh, these different types of operations. So in principle, the, the, the mechanism is through the API, the HDA API. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Then we can come to our next speaker, which will be Diego Fernandez, um, also online. Um, Diego will speak about the digital prints for the environment of the European Space Agency, a new program, I think, that will launch soon. So, Diego, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, can you see the slides? Uh, yes. Okay, so um, first, apologize for not being there, but I had to. I have to stay at home these days. So I will talk to you about, um, as you have seen from the previous presentation, CISA is uh, deeply involved in the development of Destiny, but CISA has also a dedicated uh, program on digital twins that is called the Digital Twin Earth ESA program. The program has mainly two components. One is to develop additional capabilities in terms of platform capabilities to somehow complement uh, activities of destiny. But has another important component that is what I will uh, present it to you today, which is what we call the development of EU-based digital twin components. So where did this thing come from? Um, the story is that in the last few years, you know that if you're in this business, this has been a lot of developments in terms of capabilities that their observation can bring in order to better characterize their system, different components of their systems with resolutions in a space and time that allows to uh, characterize processes that before they were not possible to characterize at global scales with a huge capacity. And that capacity is only expected to increase the new sentinels are coming, new Earth explorers are coming. So there is an increasing observational capacity that makes Earth's observation somehow uh, a critical element for the development of digital twins. So we would like to focus on that aspects and try to support the community to develop those aspects. So we, um, in the program, the thing that we are trying to do is to support the communities, to support uh, different emerging realities all across uh, ESA member states, to develop a set of what we call EU-based digital twin components that may complement uh, and maybe enrich in the future developments carried out in the context of destiny, but also their emerging European, regional, and national digital twin initiatives, where Earth observation somehow plays an important role. So the DT program will try to develop is a research uh, um, is a research and, and development program. So we will move up to what we call a pre-operational level. A number of digital twin components. This can be EU-based uh, replicas of uh, elements of the system associated to uh, applications in different domains, with a strong focus in valorizing the role of novel association capabilities. This is why ESA is interested. We are a space agency and our programs try to maximize the impact of association capacity. So this program is mainly dedicated to that. The development will address uh, different domains. So I will tackle that later, but always try to somehow uh, prepare a potential um, transition from these developments into an uh, operational uh, digital twin ecosystem through programs like Destiny or maybe other, other initiatives in, in Europe. So a digital twin component should have a number of elements. It has to be integrated uh, in a different platform. I will not focus on the platform aspects today, 
but it should have at least um, a strong component focus on what their conservation can provide, what we call a 4D, even, 4D data driven reconstruction of the Earth system. So, we'll try to provide with their conservation the best possible reconstruction of uh, the different processes that we are looking at. And then a solid, scientifically sound uh, engine, including different workflows connected all this data with different type of processes through models, artificial intelligence, maybe simple geophysical model functions or complex models or analytics. We would like to focus on aspects that have a strong community support. That means that have a strong community focus in terms of stakeholders, scientists, policymakers, value-added companies, etc. The budget that we have is quite uh, is quite um, substantial, but it's still we would like to focus on those aspects that have a strong community focus. I will I will talk to you a little bit later about that. So a little bit of example. So to prepare the program, we have been working a lot on what we call precursor activities. We have uh, several of them in different domains. I will just show you two of them. This has been something that we have developed together with a team of experts led by the University of Edinburgh. And the challenge here was, OK, we have been developing for the last few years several products trying to reconstruct all these things that you see here, all the processes that characterize, for instance, Antarctica, from the lithosphere to the surface, the interactions with the oceans, the interactions with the atmosphere. So the thing that we were trying to do was putting together a number of data sets that we have been developing, trying to characterize all these different aspects in terms of what this observation can provide and connect those data with different models regional climate models providing information about the uh, atmosphere and the interactions with the surface, ice sheet models, sea ice models and ocean models, also water routing models below the surface of the, of the ice sheets. All that connected through a platform. And this is more or less what we were uh, trying to develop uh, in this uh, prototype. So the system at the end is, is, is just a prototype, but I will try to show you a little bit of the things that we can do today with that, is uh, integrate a number of workflows. And those workflows somehow allow us to connect different processes, from processes that happen in the surface to maybe the impacts in the ocean. An example is this theme. We are able to, with earth observation data and some modeling activities, characterize what can be the subglacial flux of water. Okay, so we can today with air observation characterize how much water we could have from uh, basal melting. This water goes to the ocean and when you have that well characterized, you can perturb that and you can see what may happen if for some reason climate change, we double that basal dissipation and we have a higher runoff. So with that higher runoff, we can see how much water will go into the to the ocean and then we can connect to an ocean model and this can tell us how much uh, this will impact for instance currents how much it will impact salinity how much this may impact even biology so this is the type of things that we are trying to to develop the type of concept that we are trying to develop Another interesting uh, aspect uh, has been something that we have done together with ERP in Italy and CNR. So um, the logic here is, okay, we have been working for the last uh, years in trying to develop products from air observation that characterize the logical processes at high resolution. So the traditional products that we were dealing with to characterize things like uh, floods and, and, and evapotranspiration, precipitation, were of this size, okay? So you have typical evapotranspiration product, 20 kilometer scale, two cores to operate at resolutions compatible with decision making at basic scale. So we have been working a lot to develop products like this that goes at one kilometer level or even below on evaporation, soil moisture, precipitation. So we are now starting to get in a position where we can use this type of high resolution data in hydrological modeling. We are not there yet. There is a lot to be done, but still we have started in this project to put things together and try to, for all the Mediterranean, try to make an analysis of the hydrological cycle, 
at the basing scale and try to develop a number of what if scenarios. In this case, for instance, the risk of flood using, for instance, a, a, a kind of uh, analysis of the last seven years and using uh, that data, the, the, the hydrological modeling, the reconstruction of the hydrological modeling to better uh, develop tools that may support uh, other modeling activities in better understanding what may happen if you have a certain conditions in terms of soil moisture and uh, potential precipitation. So this is where we are in, in terms of the program. We have um, started this year. The first thing that we have done was a consultation with the community. We wanted to identify the main uh, priorities to focus the first projects. And then we have done a call for species of interest. The call for species of interest attracted around 80 teams to provide letters. The objective of the call for species of interest was to consult the community to get the recommendations and the main ideas on the main topics to be addressed in the first calls. So we have done a review of all that wealth of information. The Objective of the review was not to identify a specific teams or a specific expressions of interest, but more to identify the main themes to start the, uh, the first calls for, uh, for projects. So this is what we have received in terms of uh, thematic areas. So as you can see, it covers a lot of different domains, um, a very wide spectrum of different applications and different type of uh, system persistent topics. And after the review, we have identified eight main priorities. The priorities include carbon cycle and terrestrial biosphere, including somehow the connections between uh, land atmosphere interactions, agriculture, forest, hydrology, and the related geoasserts, um, polar aspects, especially the impacts of ice sheets in, at, at global scale, at regional and global scale, coastal processes and the related streams, digital oceans and biodiversity. So this will be the first A priorities, but also we have received very good ideas concerning other topics, wildfires, transport and infrastructure, yes, geoassers, etc. So the thing that we plan to do is to address all these type of domains. How we plan to do it? So we are preparing uh, an ITT that will go before the end of the year. The logic is to start large activities in the order of 1.5 million to develop eight parallel projects, focusing the initial eight priority domains. And then we will have up to six projects on the other topics. This will be a, a, a smaller size type of demonstration activities, try to prepare maybe for larger projects in the future. The program will be structured into phases. The first phase will end at the end of 24. At the end of 24, we will have an event where all these things have to be presented and we will identify the next activities to be launched in 25. And with this, I would like just to close my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Diego, for this very interesting presentation. Are there any questions regarding this new program from ESA and the call. Doesn't seem to be the case for now. Thanks again, Diego, for um, Thank you. this talk. And then um, we continue now. Uh, this actually has one more talk before you, sorry. <laughs> There's actually uh, Patrick Knöffel now um, talking about the simulation of heavy rainfall events by using a digital trend. <laughs> no problem. For us, yours, Patrick. Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, hello and welcome uh, to my presentation today about the simulation of heavy, heavy rainfall events by uh, using a digital twin. Uh, I'm standing here um, I'm representing our uh, head of the geoservice department, Martin Lenk, who is unfortunately not able to present himself today. And I will do it in, instead. Yeah, let me start. If it starts. 
by uh, introducing uh, our project, our digital twin project uh, called Digital Twin Germany. Um, the project started uh, last summer and we have the ambitious uh, objective to provide an analysis platform for the federal administration as a service uh, by the end of 2026 to create related added value for a variety of societal issues. And we have uh, three essential components uh, within our project. We have uh, to establish a, a technical uh, service platform, which is uh, still um, on, in the conception phase. We have uh, to develop a data offer, which will I uh, describe in a few slides. And we have um, to develop the service together with pilot users. And so we have also to, to develop uh, um, pilot use cases. Uh, the technical platform, as I said, um, is in the conception phase. And our main goal here is to enable uh, various users from the federal, uh, federal administration by the end of 2026 to process their own questions um, either independently or assisted by us so that they can build their own applications by, by the selection from existing uh, models in our modular system or even develop own models uh, within our um, twin envi environment. Um, the data offer uh, of our twin has uh, three layers. The base layer is uh, what we call model data. This data is coming from a three-dimensional model. Um, I will explain it uh, in the next slide. And uh, the, the center layer is what we call objects of interest. This is more or less the data we already have. We, we already have access to, we already are hosting at the BKG, um, our national geo data sets, but as well, um, the earth observation data or the earth observation products or other products available. And the top layer here is uh, what we call expert knowledge. This is the data where we don't have access to right now easily. This is not in uh, our regular uh, data we, we host at the BKG. It's uh, lying in, uh, in zero so uh, till now. Uh, and only experts have um, access to it. And together with the data, we would also like to make the knowledge available uh, in order to uh, yeah, develop applications um, that can be solved with geospatial information. Yeah, the, the 3D data, um, therefore, we plan to collect a nationwide uh, um, 3D in, uh, information using LiDAR technique. Uh, the data collection will start next year and uh, will uh, last two years till the end of 2025. Uh, our plan is to uh, yeah, to repeat this uh, every three years to have a, also the possibility to make uh, changes uh, uh, detectable. Before we started with our nationwide collection, we uh, performed a preliminary project in Hamburg metropolitan region here we uh, did the specification we uh, would like to have for the nationwide collection. We tested it in, uh, in an area of about 8,600 square kilometers. We have a point density uh, of uh, about 40 points per square meters. Uh, height accuracy of these informations of better than 10 centimeters. And together with the LiDAR, we, um, we are uh, collecting aerial images with uh, 22 centimeters um, ground resolution. Yeah, here, a quick view into the, the data. This is um, a video of the point cloud, the calorized point cloud uh, for Hamburg city. Um, we have the um, RGB information coming from the aerial images, but we also are able to classify the, the points in the point cloud. We have the vegetation points, which appeared in green. We have the blue points uh, stand for water points, and we have the 
red points here for buildings. We're also um, deriving uh, soil information. And many other um, objects uh, are, are possible to derive from this data source. Yeah, and as I said, the third component is uh, the use cases. We are planned to develop together with uh, partners. And one uh, illustrative example use case is um, the uh, um, modeling of the risk of heavy, heavy rainfall because all three different uh, data layers uh, are used in this example. Uh, we have the 3D information, the elevation uh, model coming from the 3D informations. We have in the center the existing data about buildings, land cover, vegetation, or what else you need for, for your model. And we have the expert data, which is the probability of, of heavy, heavy rainfall, and all these together um, fed in a hydrological model. And in the end, we have, an, we have what we call advisory maps on the risk of heavy rainfall. Um, this is an ongoing project. The project started already in 2020. And uh, we started by uh, simulating two different flooding scenarios. Um, and the results of these uh, scenarios um, are maps of water levels and maps of low velo velocities for these two uh, scenarios. And these uh, uh, risk zones maps are um, published in our national geo portal. Um, as I said, the project started 2020 um, in North Rhine-Westphalia. This is a dark blue um, federal state on the map. Uh, right now, we are calculating uh, heavy rainfall um, maps for the light blue federal states. And by the end of 2025, we plan to have uh, yeah, uh, these maps for entire Germany. Uh, this project uh, had some main challenges, uh, as well as the integrated uh, data management or the integration of precise rain forecasts in the model. It also is an issue of the calculation time uh, for more dynamic prediction, for, for example, for regional warnings. And here, the digital twin comes into play. Uh, we have the idea that we use more current informations to uh, do more precise uh, or more accurate um, predictions. And here, we would like to use uh, the terrain information coming from our 3D data. We would like to integrate more um, geodata information, for example, where are um, the inhabitants uh, living and affected, points of interest and others. And so that in the end, we would be able to have a dynamic tool for, for flooding simulations for uh, regional uh, warnings with a simulation hour less than one hour. Yeah, and this is planned to be prototyped with our digital twin Germany. So in collaboration with research institutes and uh, environmental authorities, we, uh, we just started uh, with this idea and we think the first results will be available next year or the day after, uh, the year after. Okay, and uh, my last slide is a kind uh, of yeah, of an appetizer for my for my uh, e-poster I have after this session outside. We have already some preliminary results for other pilot use cases. We have a forest use case where we um, test a, a national single tree in inventory. We have an agricultural use case to um, identify woody landscape elements, uh, flight obstacles in a security uh, use case, and also a socio-economic use case. So if you're interested, please visit me outside afterwards. And uh, with this, I would like to thank. Thank you very much, um, Patrick. Uh, are there any questions for Patrick from the room? One quick question from Osman over there. <laughs> Uh, hello, dear. Thank you so much for your productive uh, session. 
I just a question: uh, What type of the extreme rainfall probability data you that you have put into your digital twin? Uh, this one is uh, if you can just open the slide, like about the type of the extreme rainfall data that you have used it in your digital twin. I cannot open any slide, unfortunately. But uh, uh, in case Ivan, can you go back to the slide? Yeah. So you can go back. Ah, okay. So which you slide? Can go back about the type of the data. Back. Yes, this one, like about the probability of yes, heavy rainfall. So for this one, we uh, like uh, what type of the uh, probabilities and is it only like the uh, scenarios or what type of this heavy rainfall probabilities that you have used in it? Uh, this this data uh, about the probability of heavy rainfall we receive from our uh, uh, how's it called weather uh, hmm. uh, <laughs> German weather service and I don't know I'm not not that deep into uh, into these details in in the in this uh, for this probability map yeah. but and I, as this one maybe we can have more discussion later sorry for yeah. that. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you. Then again, to seeing this view into the national digital twins also. Now we have uh, our final presentation here, um, which will be on the interoperability of digital twins of the ocean with data space and data lakes presented by Lente Lilia Baif. Uh, I hope that was pronounced correctly. <laughs> and uh, Ivan will bring up your presentation in a second. So, as you can tell, um, I was very eager to come here and speak <laughs> about the digital twin. Um, yes. Oh, there's something, it looks a little bit strange. Um, okay. So, what I will do is give you uh, an overview of uh, Iliad, Digital Twin of the Ocean Project. I will, of course, talk about uh, various aspects of various perspectives on uh, architecture, uh, covering data spaces and data lakes and how we are handling that in uh, Iliad. And again, interoperability, interoperability within Iliad and with other, um, with other uh, initiatives. Uh, well, um, I'm following, I will try to cover the harmonizations um, and the interoperability of different implementations and challenges in support of sustainability of what we are doing. So I will cover that while I'm presenting. So we have been talking about digital twins now. Here's uh, our division uh, definition. Uh, I just want to uh, add to what you've seen here that we are not only uh, addressing the uh, what if scenarios of digital twins. You also have type of uh, situational overview uh, twins. And also some, some uh, says that um, having data, uh, the latest data that fits your need is also sort of a twin. But so we have a little bit of a variation of the, of the definition. Interoperable again is very important. So our approach in uh, Iliad uh, is that we, we realize the ocean is very complex and very vast. And it consists of uh, geophysical, biological, um, and numerous interaction between these components and human activity. And in Europe, and to, to reflect this complexity in the European digital twin of the ocean, you might have heard about that, um, EU itself, uh, its members, associated uh, countries like Norway, I come from Norway, um, and uh, many are contributing to developing uh, a core infrastructure, modeling capacity, and implementations on local and thematic twins. And this ecosystem of twins, I think we've seen this today already, um, it's, uh, and all the components is then what we refer to um, the digital twin, uh, ocean twin. Uh, this is a political statement um, I, on a high level, but just to rem remind us that it it's a lot of uh, uh, components and investments on many levels. 
So uh, we, uh, the partnership in Iliad, we are 56 partners, so it's a huge um, green deal and it's an innovation action and you will, uh, I will come back to that. And we are aligning the best we can with other initiatives and making interoperability through and throughout. So the key components, to repeat, interoperable digital twins, and we are connecting existing resources, we've seen several, and we are also adding um, new resources through both, uh, with, we have sensors, so we are adding new data, but also new uh, applications, um, including here citizens. Uh, in order to make this accessible, available to um, the rest of the community, the ecosystem, we have a marketplace where you can find not only the digital twins, but also the different components that we make interoperable. I will come back to that. And of course, we are providing uh, solutions to the challenges that we uh, face. So a federated interoperable system is what we are building. And here is a, just a quick reminder of the pipeline. Uh, we uh, collect the data, we uh, prepare the data, we do the analysis, and then we have the visualization, the, the user interface for, for the end users. And uh, the similarity you see is the same, same for digital twins. Uh, here you see the, uh, the logical architecture of, of, um, of Iliad. And uh, you have the different sources, instrumentation, sensors, et cetera. We have then um, the um, partners who are building twins, um, collecting and preparing this data, and also adding uh, open other open data, but also commercial and restricted uh, data and so forth. So we, we combine all this. Um, Cataloging this is key in order to make it interoperable. So we have this cataloging of both data and services. And uh, we have a data uh, space that we create and use. And then in the end, we have a digital twin that we, uh, and I'm showing here, I think it was already shown uh, the Edito, which is, Edito is sort of the core, what you can say the core infrastructure that all of us in Europe uh, can use, well, not only Europe, I think, <laughs> um, to, uh, and where how that is linked to what we are using. So I won't go into this, I see there are some mistakes here, but the principles of data spaces, uh, one thing I want to highlight is the sovereignty of the data is, is an important factor. So this is, um, uh, I just want to uh, highlight that. I'll move fast. <laughs> uh, what I want you to notice here are three things. The APIs, the yellow dots, that is key to making interoperability within the infrastructure of, of Iliad. And I want you to notice the data lakes and the data spaces um, columns. And on the top, you see um, swirling around different uh, twins. So, uh, we are using both um, data lakes, we are using data lakes, and we are needing data lakes for the solution of the individual twins. We are also using data spaces and creating data spaces and feed into other data spaces. Uh, all this will be made, all of these components that we are making interoperable will be put on the Iliad marketplace and then reiterated. We already have examples of reuse of components in one of our twins or several of our twins into another twin. It could be in another thematic twin, so a different domain or on a different location. Of course, it needs ad adaptation, but this is the purpose and this is why, you know, a part of the sustainability strategy to make all of these components available um, for reuse is a part of a strategy. So here you see there's a number of different thematic areas that we, uh, when you look down and zoom in on what the digital twin is. A digital twin is serving specific needs and it covers basically all the sectors you can think of. So we have aquaculture and fisheries, uh, we have um, uh, oil spill, we have renewable energy in different forms. There's a number of different thematic areas. 
and there are commonalities and there are specific specificities. Now, <laughs> as I said, we are using um, and contributing to the different data spaces. And it needs to be, I, I think it was a question here, that you need to make these data spaces also interoperable. And here I just added some arrows to show that in a digital twin, we are using several of the thematic uh, data spaces already, and we will contribute to that as well. So here is the, for each of the digital twins in Iliad, you have the same structure because we want them to be interoperable and reuse uh, components of it. So it has a, a system uh, architecture that is compatible with the overall architecture. Uh, and you see how the data lakes and the open data and, and the ocean data space, I will come back to that, um, are linked or how that is connected to the individual uh, digital twins. And as we are creating a, an ocean data space, we are also integrating that with the Green Deal data space. We have, uh, as I said, the Iliad project is a part of a Green Deal. And we found it necessary in order to make a, an important part of making um, uh, all of these components interoperable uh, is to have a new uh, information model. So ocean information model was missing. And in Iliad, we are developing this. Never mind all the details. You see that it's been, it's a thorough work on um, uh, Iliad cross domain ontology. And you can see the link, this will be shared. So if you're interested, you can check it out afterwards. So this is one of the uh, components. And here you see also the ocean information model and overview with the different layers, which is similar to several. I will come back to that. So you have the core, you have the cross domain, you have the um, pilot specific, and you see here listed uh, a few of the pilots that we have integrated in here. This is a jellyfish pilot, by the way, that is a citizen science pilot um, based on citizen science data for uh, collected over 10 years. You have a oil spill pilot and you have a water quality pilot, all very different. But there's a similarities in language, but there are also very specific uh, expressions. For instance, for, for a jellyfish, uh, what you, um, an important factor there is uh, the distance between where the jellyfish was, was and uh, the, the, uh, the shore, or if it was stinging or not. This is not fitting uh, in, you know, in a general um, ocean <laughs> information model. And what we saw, what we, our ocean information model was built on the agriculture information model. So it's the same structure. And we think that this will be something that can be used uh, also for the uh, Green Deal data spaces. I think we will learn more about that in the session, uh, coming session. So you see there's a structure that is similar. Again, uh, helpful for interoperability and uh, sustainability. And here, uh, <laughs> something went very wrong. <laughs> and here you clearly see <laughs> all the contributions from um, what it shows, actually what I can tell you. You have, you have heard the other speakers from Destination Earth, uh, from, from ESA, and you know, there are so many components and all together we are uh, contributing uh, to um, the overall uh, goals, political goals. That's what this says. <laughs> and um, we, we are talking about digital twins, and this is also in line with the overall uh, global view of it. So we are contributing to DITO, which is a UN um, ocean science decade uh, activity. Thank you very much. Uh, I was um, my co-author Arne Jorgen Bader from uh, from Sintef. He asked me to remind you there's a next week or so there's a, an event where we can go deeper into this. And uh, if Arne is here, he will uh, share it in the chat, so you can have that. Great. Uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. Are there any direct questions to Bente now?
Yes, Franz. So thanks, uh, thanks for this very nice presentation. Very interesting. Um, I was wondering a bit. So we have all these data lakes now. You said you build data space, data lake. I mean, we will discuss probably also in the next session. I hope you, mm. you will be there. Yeah. But how do you actually build a data space, and how is that linked to the destination Earth data lake? Wow. Well, yeah. there there are certain um, certain requirements to build a data space. So it's part of for individual pilots, uh, you will build a space that is necessary for that pilot. How you will do it, I mean, uh, the details exactly, what do you ask for which uh, technology we're using? It's uh, APIs, <laughs> uh, of course, APIs, but I know I see Joan is but here. You, you build and the interoperability. Not existing infrastructures, basically. Where do you, where's the data? Uh, uh, where, where? Yeah, it depends on the individual. Again, the individual pilots will determine where to put uh, their. Um, the data, where they will do the processing, etc. It depends on each of the, the cases. In some of the cases where you need a lot of processing, for instance, it's naturally to go to Edito, for instance, or other already existing cooperation that they have. And what is, I, I didn't mention this, but actually in, we have, we are not only European, we also have Africa and the Middle East. So we are looking at uh, Europe in a, in a more integ integrated uh, sp um, fashion. And for that reason, it might be other, um, you know, resources that they will, uh, that we use. Thank you very much. Um, now I would invite all speakers back on the stage. Sorry, Patrick, I didn't remind you, but <laughs> no one escapes here. So <laughs> well, I, I pushed you all for the time so hard so that we indeed have a little bit of time left for discussion. So we have about 15 minutes now that we can uh, discuss some of the questions that are maybe also relevant for Eurogeo and how the work uh, that we do with all the digital twins uh, fits into this, uh, how maybe Eurogeo can also contribute to this. Eurogeo as is right now doesn't have a working group on digital twins, for example. This session we added extra as a, as a new theme, so might also be something to consider if this is a topic that is transversal and relevant enough for Eurogeo and possibly also Geo then in the, in the next step. Um, um, so maybe a first question to the people who have presented now, what, what's your thought on this? How, how do you think that uh, digital twins uh, can fit into Eurogeo? How can it maybe Eurogeo also help to channel all these different developments? Any thoughts on this? Someone who feels to go first? Also the speakers online, of course, uh, Diego and Jordi, you are also invited to comment on this. Right. Um, so from Destination Earth, I think what is important indeed is that these different initiatives uh, around digital twins uh, come together. And if uh, Eurogeo can uh, closer, all right, I was had a huge echo, so that's fine. <laughs> all right, perfect. So I think uh, what is apparent from the, from the presentations that we had here is that everybody is still sort of building their own uh, platforms, even though we talk a lot about interoperability and so on. Um, sorry. So I think if Eurogiro can play a role there to bring these initiatives together and create a platform where we can discuss it, then obviously that, that, would, be, that would be great. Thanks for, for that comment. Any additional thoughts? So this first comment was a common platform. Uh, into, yeah. Yes, I think that uh, Eurogeo uh, could uh, work for um, for the uh, digital twin space, just as um, any other um, coordination work done in Geo. I mean, we need to coordinate to identify. Um, um, sharing of responsibility when that's natural or uh, when we need to have overlap that's another thing that we can discuss and also if we if there are gaps that we are discussing how to to cover those gaps and i think in uh, eurogeo in addition 
what what Eurogeo is then uh, helping us with is to link closer to the each of the nations. So, for instance, Germany here and other nations have what they are. I know UK has a, a large uh, activity, a lot of activity on digital twins. So I think Eurogeo can uh, play a role in coordinating that on that level in the more, you know, zoomed in level. Great, uh, thanks um, for that feedback. I, I guess this is a really important. There's also a, a raised hand by Jordi, so feel free to comment. Yes, I think it is in this role of, um, let's say, setting a, a collaboration or a cooperation between the different platforms uh, from the technological perspective. I mean, there's a lot of uh, of things to harmonize no? because when we are I mean, all these digital twins will be generating data that is located somewhere in an infrastructure somewhere. And then, from UMED side, we have always we had always the the idea that we need to move the processing where the data is. But to do this, we need the technology to be ready. I mean, where the data is placed, the technology around this data needs to be ready to host this. In the in then being, the question we had before. I mean, we are building an HDA and harmonized data access interface that will allow to do access to the data, but also provide processing functions. But for this, we need the platforms that are hosting the data to be ready to host this. And then obviously this needs uh, a lot of discussion and harmonization between the different platforms, and it's not an easy task. Thanks, uh, Jordi, also for that comment. I think uh, an important aspect we also heard uh, is the, the scale of arbitrary work with the different digital twins, which definitely also creates some challenges with respect to what data we use. I found this also interesting when looking at Patrick's presentation, there were basically completely different data sets that were looking on a national level, different types of resolution, for example, of the optimizational data, different um, accuracy requirements, maybe then also on that somehow when we link done from the national level to the international level on the other um, we, we need to take this into account of course uh, this this also links to the other issue that we have with generally the information silos as you said or the, you call them also the expert uh, information which uh, we, we are not always aware of all the things that are out there in, in specific domains um, so i think there can also be a, a good role when we have such a platform as, as thomas suggested where we can start to find th these things um so um maybe also from the national level i guess uh, how, how do you actually deal with this because a digital twin in germany for example cannot be defined just by data from germany as you have cross-border effects and things and so on so generally on the national level i was also wondering how, how do you tackle this challenge how did you get the information from across the border um yeah, it's not only across the borders, it's also within the borders. So we have uh, digital twins from municipalities or federal states, and they are even have more precise information, and we have to uh, aggregate this information in order to, uh, to gain uh, data that we could use on a national level. And um, yeah, to, to, to make sure that um, across borders that applications can be or um, 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 information can be shared. We, we we only could communicate with each other. So we start uh, talking to our neighbors. Uh, for example, um, France and uh, has a similar uh, lidar approach. So maybe we can exchange information. What we can uh, derive from this data, and yeah, um, it's active communication. Uh, unfortunately, there is no uh, uh, coordination done so far. So. That's why I would appreciate a, a coordination uh, of these initiatives, national initiatives. Great. Uh, thank you for that feedback as um, well. Um, another important part of this whole harmonization uh, um, and also in, uh, interoperability aspect is uh, standardization. We saw a little bit of this also in, in Bente's uh, presentation, I think also in, there's uh, some direction that goes towards the port. So I can imagine that this also might be a point where, where we can. My microphone is dying. So um, 
standardization is definitely an important uh, issue there um, and we have also seen i think this was a very nice to present this also to to show when you start setting up a digital twin really look what's already there i think that's also one of the risks that we sometimes start a little bit too quick with new things and new developments looking into the existing technologies this existing specification and standards is, is quite important um, there we need to have also very detailed technical discussions i saw a lot of presentation today also the other days which speak about apis but just because you have an api it's not yet interoperability because there are lots of different apis which work uh, very differently so the api is the first chance to even interact with it let's say but then probably to make the interaction easier and more interoperable they, they also should work uh, the same way or at least as close as possible so that's uh, an important aspect uh, and the other one is on the on the data catalogs i think there as well we, uh, we should strive to to find a common way of describing all uh, the the data sets that we have uh, maybe there are also some comments from from the different digital twins uh, regarding especially those working with different domains uh, how how do we deal with this um, cataloging of of the information basically andrea has a comment there. yeah so uh... Yeah, it's true that this is quite important also in uh, in our project. And uh, as I mentioned in one of my slides, I think what we are trying to do is to reuse some of the technology that are coming from one domain and trying to adapt it also to, to the other domains, for instance, the energy physics and the your domain. Uh, for this case, for instance, we are trying to uh, implement Stack, which is kind of one of the de facto standards now for the for this uh for the cataloging also in in other uh in the other um in the technology that has been used for instance in uh, in the physics part um i, I would say that in, in the, if we see the our project the catalog part is more important only for the EO part not so much important for the digital prints that that we have but i agree that of course this is uh, quite important uh, feature that uh, has to be you know taken into account you know when building you know digital twins and digital twin engines so this is my take thanks Andrea. there was also a comment here from the audience yes thank you very much my name is Ifigenia Keramitsoglu I'm from the National Observatory of Athens thank you very much for the presentations I just wanted to to put a dimension um, in the discussion that uh, in uh, all the recent calls and also the new projects uh, where there, there are going to be digital twins developed, there is a requirement to be coordinated uh, ac according to d Destination Earth. Uh, so I would like to ask you uh, what exactly this means in, in practical terms, in terms of communication between the partners who are going to develop it and uh, ESA, ECM, WF, and the partners who are in the core of uh, Destination Earth, and uh, also in technical terms, so communication and technical terms, what does this mean? And if maybe Eurogeo Working Group um, could play a role in this. Thank you. Thanks for this question. I'm, I think, first of all, it means that Thomas Mailbox is exploding every time there's a new call. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, maybe you can comment on that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, indeed. So, uh, typically, what we, the model that, that we use for that is something similar to what we also do with, with Intertwin and, and BioDT. That typically, we participate in these, in these, uh, in these calls, in these projects uh, to make sure that there's alignment with Destination Earth. Obviously, the, all the interfaces I described have uh, well-documented and well-APIs, um, um, uh, and we also try to stick to standards. So, for instance, there was one slide that I, that, I, that I couldn't show in the end, where we went through the exercise of implementing yet another standard on top of our standard, because, as you know, a lot of communities have, have their own standards, right? So one of, the, one of the, the challenges that we have is you're going to have to provide uh, multiple standards, right? As an as a consumption uh, interface. So, what you're asking, like, how how can you coordinate if you want to um, apply for these calls? You want to coordinate with destination Earth, then you can reach out to us, and we can uh, we can sit together and understand how we can write the call so that this this aspect is covered. Okay, thanks uh, very much also for this active discussion and your comments here. We are coming to the end of the session now.
before we close, I would like to give a hand to all the speakers again. So thanks a lot for your nice contributions. <laughs>